Meet George, a roseate spoonbill. We know a lot about George. In 2005 through 2009, we put these backpats on the bird that were satellite transmitters. So every hour, it would take a reading, a GPS reading, and then every day it would send us that data so we know where these birds are going and when they're coming. It, two years ago, we started repeating that study. So we go in and we capture adult spoonbills and we put a little harness on them with a little GPS transmitter with a, a solar powered little battery thingy. It's a little device that we put on. It, the, the backpack takes a reading every 15 minutes of where the birds are, records that, and then when the bird encounters a, a, a cell phone signal, it downloads it. I mean, for me, I just really love this kind of data. Like, it's, it's so cool when you get a hit from a bird and you get like, over a thousand points throughout the whole bay and you can see where it's been flying around and stuff like that. So it's, it's neat to see their little secret world. And the whole purpose of the project really is to see how climate change is affecting, how human interactions are affecting these birds. George is telling us that something is changing in the Everglades. George was caught back in January of 2021 and he was caught in the bay on a nest and he nested there, and we think, we believe we had a success, like he had, he managed to raise chicks with his partner. After that, however, he started to go more into the Everglades. When he's not nesting, the bird just, it would take off and fly up to West Palm Beach, uh, um, you know, western, western Palm Beach County, near, near the Everglades and would hang out there and he's hanging around people's backyards, feeding in the lakes that, that, that they're, you know, hanging out in. And I got pictures of people sitting, the birds just sitting there on like their, their outdoor table. You know, a foraging flight for a spoonbill is typically about, you know, 12 to 13 kilometers. That's about as far as they're gonna go. When he's feeding his young, he was flying 25 and 50 kilometers. So that in itself was quite an interesting pattern, kind of proving, but the Everglades might have some issues, you know, where birds in its natural habitat would fly into essentially human developed land and go foraging there. Why? To answer that question, we need to zoom out, way out. The Everglades is one of the world's largest wetlands. Covering three million acres and draining even more, this unique landscape is essential to the drinking water for more than eight million Floridians. But nearly a century of draining and ditching has altered the river of grass. Now, not enough water reaches the Everglades. The federal and state government are devoting billions of dollars to fix these 20th century mistakes, and it all starts with Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is the liquid heart of the Everglades, and it is fed through the headwaters of the Kissimmee River, north of the lake, uh, sort of around the Orlando area. Which it's about 30 to 35 miles across. Um, it has about 200 square miles of wetlands in it, the marshes and plants and all that. And it really is in the very middle of the Everglades ecosystem. And it would fill up over time and then sort of spill over the edge and trickle down into the river of grass uh, through a process called sheet flow. And that sheet flow would slowly move all across the southern Everglades ecosystem, eventually ending up in the Gulf of Mexico and the 10,000 Islands, Florida Bay, and even Biscayne Bay. What happened is all the water used to feed the Everglades and really be a, a big part of the Everglades hydrology. Um, but when we decided to drain the state, what we did was we realized, well, the St. Lucie estuary is only 35 miles away, and Florida Bay is 100, so let's drain it that way because it's shorter. And they've drained water also to the Caloosahatchee. And so nowadays, those estuaries get way more water than they're supposed to get. It's terrible for them. And the Everglades doesn't get enough water. So what Everglades restoration is about is trying to take that water, a valuable resource, and send it back south where it's supposed to go, and not east and west where it's not supposed to go. Okeechobee is really important for getting the water right to flow it back to the Everglades. Um, but Okeechobee is so big, it's a resource in its, of itself. And it hosts all the wading birds in South Florida, about 15 species, except for the reddish egret, which is coastal. Um, in the wintertime, we have about 15 or 20 species of waterfowl that come down from the north and, and stay here for the winter and live on the lake. Um, the Everglades snail kite, the endangered snail kite, nests on Lake Okeechobee and depends on a good, healthy lake. And that's where George and Audubon's Everglades Science Center comes in. The roseate spoonbill is an official indicator species for the overall health of the Everglades, a true canary in the coal mine. An indicator species is an animal that tells us how the health of its environment is. 
So in, in, you know, in the case here, we use roseate spoonbills. Um, they're very sensitive to the fluctuations in water, the fluctuations in salinity. And so if the spoonbill's healthy, that tells us the bay's healthy, which means that you know, the things that re people r really care about, and they do care about spoonbills, but it also means the fishing, right? If, if the bay is healthy, we have more snook and more permit and more tarpon. And it's also attractive, you know, and that's what people come to Florida, especially the Keys, to see is, is pretty water. If it's not healthy, if it's green, if it's, you know, if it's got a nutrient problem, if seagrass dies off, then the spoonbills are the first thing to show that the bay is not healthy. To study the movement and nesting success of roseate spoonbills, the Everglades Science Center has tagged more than 3,000 chicks with leg bands, employed 50 camera traps to monitor chick survival, and have tracked 10 spoonbills with satellite tracking backpacks. George has already shown us some surprising movement patterns, and he's not the only one. Suki has been tracked all the way to Georgia. When we did the study in, you know, way back when, it was rare for birds to go north of Tampa Bay on the Gulf Coast or Cape Canaveral on the East Coast. As a matter of fact, historically, going back to the 1800s, they never nested any further than those two places north. Now we have nesting at Cedar Keys, um, at St. Augustine Alligator Farm, um, and then about five or six years ago, maybe seven or eight now, they started nesting in southern Georgia. Other birds might have flown even further, we just don't know at this point. And that's, once again, why we tr try and track as many birds as we can. So what's changed? It's warmer. So these birds suddenly have a whole world open up to them because it doesn't get cold. And these trees around that you see, mangrove trees, are also moving north. And they kind of co-locate with mangroves. So as we get more mangroves growing further north, you're going to have spoonbills. And so they're expanding their range. They're just not doing so good here in Florida Bay because of sea level rise has changed the concentration of the prey. So they don't, can't find enough food. And although Everglades restoration is making some, uh, some big differences in the bay, it's still not as getting as much fresh water as it should, but they're just moving inland. They're going to places where they can nest. Overall, roseate spoonbills may be shifting their range northward as the changing climate increases water depths in Florida Bay, preventing the concentrated prey opportunities the spoonbill needs to feed voracious chicks. Why then is Everglades restoration so important? Everglades restoration is so important because we've completely altered the natural flow of the Everglades ecosystem. We have hyper-engineered this, this ecosystem. We have drained the swamp. And now we have to undo the damage that we've done. And Everglades restoration creates a path for us to do that and a plan for us to do that. And that's not only going to provide benefits for the ecosystem, it will also provide resilience benefits and benefits uh, for humans that live in our area. And so Everglades restoration is partly about trying to reverse that drainage, trying to catch that water. And then when you catch it, you can try to clean it because we've also done a lot of pollution through um, fertilizers and, and human waste and other things that people do, we pollute the water. And so with Everglades Restoration, we're going to try to slow that water down. We're going to try to clean it before it goes into our, our big ecosystems. And then we're going to try to move it. We've lost half of the Everglades through drainage, but we've lost 90% of the birds, the wading birds. And that's because the remaining Everglades are not very healthy. We know a healthier lake will create a healthier Everglades. So what can we do to help the roseate spoonbills and restore the lake? So the best thing that you can do is for this indicator species to make things better for an indicator species so everything else will get better is let's keep attacking Everglades restoration. Keep putting money behind it. Keep putting public pressure on and to get it done right. One of the best things that we can do as a community to help the Everglades is to stay engaged and involved in these issues. Letting your voice be heard, calling for concerted action uh, to address issues and threats that the Everglades might face, calling for support for Everglades restoration and funding. Uh, these are all things that we can do in our, in our daily lives to ensure that our interests in protecting and restoring the Everglades are reflected in political forums.